Welcome to Sunday School Made Simple, the fastest growing online community of Christian education teachers and students of the word. Hi, I'm Dr. Laverne Tolbert, and I'm so excited about this new year as we continue to explore the word of God using the precepts for living commentary. Now remember to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any lessons. Our goal is not merely to download information, but that students receive revelation. And that's why we provide additional resources at preceptsforlivingonline.com. Subscribe to gain access on your tablet, your phone, or your laptop. So go to preceptsforlivingonline.com and get your resources today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this word that we are going to share. May it encourage your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our first quarter this year is entitled Responding to God's Grace, and it focuses on the biblical response to God's salvation, preservation, provision, forgiveness, healing, blessings, and grace. Before we move further, let's define grace. You know, so often we use theological terms, especially in our churches and in our Christian world, without understanding their meaning. Grace and mercy, those are words that we use so often, but do we really know what they mean? Let's explain. Grace is God's unmerited favor to undeserving man. In other words, God gives us favor, his grace, that we cannot earn and we don't deserve. Example, we can't earn salvation. We can't be good enough in our own efforts for, to work our way into heaven. It doesn't work like that, but God gives us the gift of salvation. It's to be received. This gift is given not because we deserve it, it's because of God's love that he saves us. So God's unmerited favor to undeserving man. Memorize that. And then let's explain mercy while we're at it. Mercy is when God withholds what we do deserve. We should shout hallelujah on that one. <laughs> you know why? God doesn't give us what we deserve, the punishment, the you know, the consequences of our sin, he doesn't give it to us. So let me give you an example of grace and mercy. My daughter was being disciplined and I told her, look, you are grounded, you're home, and that's it. However, I wanted to go shopping. So I said, okay, you have to go shopping with me because I don't want to leave you home alone. And I took her shopping with me. Of course, she found a dress that she wanted to buy. Mommy, can I have this dress? And I said, well, what is the definition of grace? I don't know. She was about 12 at that time. I said, Laneige, grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. I said, I'm buying this dress for you. You don't deserve it because you should be home being grounded, but I'm going to buy this dress for you. I said, and mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. I said, you deserve a spanking, but I'm not gonna give you a spanking. <laughs> that's an example of grace and mercy. Well, that said, let's dive into this quarter and we're going to be inspired because we'll see that God is present in times of difficulty. As you know, each week we make Sunday School simple with an easy to understand format the text for you students of the word, and teaching tips for those of you who teach. Today's lesson title, I'm turning to it right now, is God Answers Prayer, which tells the account of Hannah who desperately prayed for a child. Well, let's explore the text by looking at our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will recall the story of Hannah. I really prefer the word account, but we'll recall the story of Hannah's desperate longing for a child. Reflect on longings for God to intervene in our lives and pray with confidence that God will provide what is best for us. Let's read the first set of verses 
from our scripture lesson, and I'll be reading in the New Living Translation, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Well, what's important to know? I'm getting my keys. There are two key points to know. And I'm so grateful to a young lady named Sharice. She's so creative and she made these keys for me. Thanks, Sharice. So what are the two key points to know from 1 Samuel, verses 9 through 11? First, Hannah is miserable. She's unable to have children. And then Hannah makes a vow. You get that? The two M, miserable, makes a vow. She makes a vow to God that if he will give her a son, she will dedicate him to God. Now we do that, we use alliteration so that if you were planning a lesson, you didn't have your notes in front of you, you could teach by remembering makes a vow and being miserable. So this is Hannah's situation. So Hannah prays, God, give me a son. She was one of the two wives of Elkanah. He was an Israelite man who goes to the temple faithfully to the tabernacle to worship God every year. So the Bible tells us one wife was Hannah, the other wife was Penana, Penina. Got to get that out. <laughs> well, it's important to note word order when reading scripture. And so since Hannah's name is mentioned first, she may have been Elkanah's first wife, but she's barren. She can't have any children. So Elkanah probably marries a younger woman who will give him heirs. So remember, it was customary in those days to have more than one wife, but today we call it polygamy. <laughs> so here comes Penina, who was very fertile. She has several children. So whenever the family observes the religious celebration in Shiloh, Penina, I'm, I don't feel like I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think I am. She taunts and teases Hannah for being unable to conceive. Can you imagine how horrible that is? Someone making fun of you and laughing and joking and really kind of rubbing it in. So Elkanah understands Hannah's despair. He gives Penina a portion of meat for her and her children, but because he really loves Hannah, he gives her a double portion. He wants his love to be enough. But Hannah is miserable. She's heartbroken. She has no appetite. And she's crying uncontrollably. The Bible says in verse 10 that Hannah is in bitterness of soul. And this gives us a picture of a bear who is robbed of her cubs. This is how Hannah feels. She cries and she's aware that no one can help her but God. So she runs to the entrance of the tabernacle to cry out to God. She tells God, I'm your handmaid, which means maid servant or female slave. So she's humbling herself and she's pleading with God, the giver of life to give her a son. She makes a vow to dedicate that son to the Lord. And this dedication is symbolized by a vow that his hair will never be cut. Are you ready for the next set of verses? Let's read verses 12 through 20 from chapter one of 1 Samuel. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips moving 
but hearing no sound, he thinks she's been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked the Lord for him. Well, there are three key points to know from these verses in this lesson. And they all begin with the letter P. First point, Hannah presses her way to pray. Second point, Eli presumes that Hannah is drunk. Third point, Hannah praises God in advance for hearing her prayer. Can you imagine? Years of disappointment, tears of desperation. Hannah presses her way to pray at the entrance of the tabernacle. She knows no one can help her but the Lord. Hers is a God-sized problem. She's not concerned about what she looks like or anything. She's only concerned that God looks on her and hears her prayer. Hannah is in the depths of despair. She's so emotional that her lips are moving, but no words are coming out of her mouth. So Eli the priest is sitting nearby, and since only priests and Levites are permitted inside, Hannah is at the entrance, passionately crying out to God. But Eli says he sees her mouth moving, but he can't hear any words, and so that's why he thinks that she's drunk. He presumes that Hannah has been drinking. But Hannah quickly explains she's not drunk. She's desperate. She has been pouring drinks. She's been pouring out her heart in sorrow to the Lord. Well, after she explains herself to Eli, the priest empathizes with Hannah in her grief. He agrees with her in prayer, and then he assures her that God has heard her prayer. Now, Hannah is so excited when Eli blesses her and assures her that she immediately goes home, her heart is lifted, and her bitterness has now been exchanged for a blessing. And hers is an attitude of praise. Hannah is at peace. Why? She prayed to the Lord of hosts. And this is the first mention of Lord of her hosts in scripture. Now, first mention is very, very important when studying scripture. Whenever we see a term or phrase or word used for the first time, that gives us a clue of what it means throughout the rest of scripture. So what does it mean here? It means that Hannah understands that all creative forces and agencies are under the leadership of the Lord of hosts. He is in charge and in control. Hannah's confident, assured by the priest that God has answered her prayer. So now she's able to eat her food. <laughs> when the family left Shiloh, they didn't know what happened the night before. When they returned home, Hannah conceived and gave birth to her son, Samuel, which means God heard me. Amen. God hears and answers prayer. He answered 
Hannah's prayer. And Hannah kept her promise. When, she, when he was weaned, Samuel, she took Samuel to Eli, the priest at Shiloh, where he lived, and she said, my child is going to stay with you and serve God. Now, for those of you who wonder how she could give her child away, I know that's very, very... <sighs> However, 1 Samuel chapter 2.21 tells us that faithful God gave Hannah and Elkanah five more children, three sons and two daughters. Isn't that a beautiful lesson? Well, that's what's important to know. And now, what's important to feel? We should feel encouraged to continue to pray. And we should feel confident that God will answer our prayers. Like Hannah, we all have deep longings in our hearts, whether it's for a family, a job, an opportunity, a healing, a breakthrough, a home. We all have situations to bring before God in prayer. As with Hannah, even if it takes many years and many tears, God is able to answer exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You know what my pastor Bishop Blake says? He says, God's unlimited power makes unlimited accomplishments possible. Some prayers are not answered the way we want, but it doesn't mean God isn't listening. He's with you. The Lord of hosts fights for you. Well, that's what's important to feel. What should we do in response to today's lesson? We must petition God and press to pray. It doesn't get more simple than that. Whether for miracles in our own lives or peace in the lives of others, we should always be prayerful. There's an old song that we used to sing in the church when I was coming up. Saints, don't stop praying, for the Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying, he'll hear your cry. What the Lord has promised, that will he do. Saints, don't stop praying, he'll answer you. So I encourage you, pray, pray, pray. God hears your prayers. Yes, and he hears the silent prayers whispered from the altar of our hearts, just like he heard Hannah's prayer. His ears are always open to those who are crushed in spirit. And now when you pray, remember to pray for others, just as Eli prayed for Hannah. Believe that God is able to do the impossible and then rejoice with the assurance that God is miraculously at work in your life. And you know what to do when you rejoice? Praise him in advance. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's a beautiful lesson. That's what's important to know, feel, and do. And this year, we've added something new to our lesson. We're highlighting a key word. And this week's lesson, the key word is remembered from 1 Samuel 1.19, when it says, the Lord remembered her. Now, this word may sound a bit confusing because it's translated as remembered from the original language. But when God remembers Hannah, this is not to imply that God had forgotten about her. He didn't forget. It's impossible for God to forget. He has all knowledge. The Hebrew word zakar, Z-A-W-K-A-R, means contemplated or thought about in advance. God does not forget absolutely impossible. So he remembered her. And when he remembered her, he remembered her past. He remembered her problem. He remembered her petition. And he thought about her and focused on her in a particular way. Hannah was praying for a son. But what she didn't realize was God needed a prophet. Samuel became one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Well, now we're ready for teaching tips. How do we teach this lesson once we've gone through our text? 
Well, don't forget to begin each lesson with prayer. Pray that your students would have receptive hearts and minds to be obedient to God's word, and that you'll be creative and use a variety of methods to help your students understand. And pray that your students will apply what they've learned to their lives. Now, you can begin this lesson with hook or open the lesson. Ask the students this question. Have you ever been discouraged about unanswered prayer? If several students are comfortable sharing, ask them to share what their prayer request is. Or you can download the InFocus video from PreceptsForLivingOnline.com. And there's a question at the end of the video that says, as a believer, how does your faith encourage you when you're struggling? Good question, isn't it? Well, now you're ready for book or present the scriptures. So invite the volunteers to read the entire portion of the scriptures. Ask them, what stood out to you or resonated from these verses? And then divide the class into groups and you can have the two groups answer the questions and search the scriptures. And now you're ready for look or explore the meaning. Remember, this is when we bridge the gap between biblical times and today by bringing a lesson to what's going on in our world today. And teacher, this is a great place for a testimony. Have you ever prayed desperately for something and God answered your prayer? Remember how you opened this lesson? You asked that very same question to the students. Well, students, they really need to hear that God is able. So why not share your experience with the class? I'll share my testimony. Actually, I have two. So. I'll make it fast. Okay, so I was oh so single. I mean, if I went to another wedding, it was another bridesmaid, another guest, I was about to tear my hair out. This was, I was into my 40s and still single. And I went to God and I said, God, one of my professors had told us, gave us some insight on one of the words in scripture. And it said, when we study Genesis, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. That man means male and female. It's not good for mankind to be alone. So I took my Bible, I opened up to Genesis 2, and I said, God, you said it is not good for man to be alone. I held my Bible and I said, I'm alone, Lord, and it's not good. And I cried out to the Lord. Well, didn't take long. My husband found me because he who finds a wife finds a good thing. So I asked God, make me look like a wife. I don't want to look like a girlfriend. I don't want to look like a plaything. I want to look like a wife when my husband sees me. And sure enough, when he saw me, I looked like a wife. You know why? He proposed on the third date. That's what I'm talking about. He met my dad, my father loved him, oh, and we've been married so many years, decades now, and God has been so good to us. That's my first testimony. Second testimony, our daughter, married, grown, children, grandchildren, love the grandchildren. Her husband got a job in another state. We prayed. I helped her pack up and move, but I said, Lord, these are our grandchildren. I have one daughter, Lord, bring her home. <sighs> Didn't take long, nine months later, she was back in LA. God answers prayer, so pray. So teacher, share your testimony. And then once you've done that, I get so excited, I get excited about God. I get excited about God because God is real. And, and that's the reason we share our testimony, because it, it encourages the saints to see God working on our behalf today. And so, now you can ask students to read the in-depth paragraphs. Once you read the scriptures, go to in-depth, and give them time to answer the questions at the end of each section. You can do this individually or as a small group. For discuss the meaning, allow students to answer the question perhaps as a whole. Now, you're ready for took or the next step for application. Remember, no lesson is complete unless we do something with what we've learned. 
So invite a volunteer to read Liberating Lesson and then read Application for Activation. <sighs> there you are. You have taught your lesson well. Remember to end the class in prayer and bless your students as they leave. You know, if you're, you're having class early in the morning, it's always good to have a little snack for your students before they come into class. Well, that's our lesson. Guess what time it is? It's time for Mailbag. Welcome to Mailbag, and our special guest is Alan Reynolds, for you millennials, for me, Minister Alan Reynolds. We're so glad to have you here. With us on Mailbag, uh, Minister Reynolds is a writer, speaker, youth pastor. He does it all. <laughs> and he's a student of the word, graduate from seminary. And those are his credentials, but it takes life to answer this question. Yes, so here's the question. How do you know when God's answer to your prayer is no? Oh, that's a good question. Is that a good one? It is. Okay, um, so. So one of the major things I think about, well, there are two. Mm -hmm. One is that God says that he gives us the desires of our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, first in that regard, we want to make sure our desires line up with God's desires. Amen. You have to spend time in the word of God. You That's have right. to spend time with God to know God's character. And that will condition your heart. Yes. And so if your heart's in alignment with God, then you can know your desires are alignment with God's will. And so if you still have the desire, then you probably are are good to keep waiting in faith like Hannah did for right. her prayer to be answered. Some pastors say that God gives you the desires he wants you to desire. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. so, but that's when you have a relationship with him, when Ex you're really in his word. Exactly, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, in addition to that, to know that you are hearing a no is just as you would try to uh, get confirmation for a yes, you should seek confirmation from God for a no. And so one of the things I do is that I'll ask God all outright. If I'm waiting on something or if I'm thinking something, desiring something, I'm going to ask God, Lord, if it's no. And you have to be at a place of faith to make that kind of prayer request. Yes. That if God tells you no, will you still trust God? Ooh. Because if you don't, then what you've done is made that desire into an idol and God can't give it to you anyway. Wow. If you're in that place where you do trust God and you're willing to receive a no, Ask God for confirmation. He's faithful to answer prayer. Yes, he is. And so if you ask for confirmation, a uh, God, however that works for you, some mm -hmm. for some people it's, you know, a scripture that might stand out to them. For some people it's wise counsel. For some mm -hmm. people it's, you know, you were out somewhere or saw something, watched something, and it mm -hmm. just got that resonating no for you. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you can know that you heard a no from God. And that's that's what's been helpful for me. That is wisdom. I'm telling you, wisdom from above. And I know it helped this person who asked this question. I pray it helped you also. We're so glad you joined us for Sunday School Made Simple. And thank you, Minister Allen, for that insight, for answering this question. And I'm going to remind you, our viewers, to subscribe to our show. And also, we'd appreciate it if you like the show. We love hearing your comments. And now we're going to end with our Keep in Mind scripture, which I'm going to ask Minister Allen to read for us. Sure. And I'll read from the New Living Translation. Okay. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, chapter 1, verse 17, <laughs> excuse me. And it says, In that case, Eli said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Go in peace.